Good afternoon, viewers and listeners. My name is Kevin Graham and welcome to your award-winning Axon Bulletin. Today I'm joined by Brian and Colin and we're, and we're all out of isolation, I think. Yeah, we're all, uh, well, we are all out of isolation, yes? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes, yes, yep, yes. All out, yep. And we just want to inform the public that our tests weren't done by Liverpool Football Club or some independent company <laughs> in Belfast. <laughs> Brian, how are you today? I'm incredible, mate. I'm good. I'm, um, I'm choking to go out and go for a walk and just escape the four walls of the house now that isolation's <laughs> over. So um, I don't think I'm quite brave enough to wander to the pub, but I'm certainly dying to get, get out and get a bit of fresh air. Colin, how's Sunny Green up today? Uh, not so sunny, and that probably doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, no, it's uh, as I said, it's good to be out and about. It's good to catch up with yourself and Paul on Sunday when we covered good. the B team game. Uh, yeah, it's it was good, good to see everybody. And uh, Brian, I hope that you get to the pub as soon as possible, mate. Uh, as a as a somebody who abstains from drinking alcohol, I'm going to I'm going to wish you well, Brian, when you go to the pub and just watch what you're doing. Um, <laughs> Right, I'm going to ask you a question to start off with. Which ex-Celtic player is currently playing at the African Cup of Nations? Couldn't I ben you? Colin hits it right oh, on oh, the oh, head. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <Can you, laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Couldn't I ben you left Celtic in uh, 2020 and he joined non-league Wildstone, is it Rovers? Is it Wildstone Rovers? What was that wee guy on Twitter? Uh, nah, Wildstone Rovers, aye. you want some, I'll give it to you, guy. That's, aye, um, that, 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 that's the fella, aye. Uh, he's now playing in Iceland with Vestery and he's part of the Zimbabwe squad for the African Cup of Nations. Have any of you watched any of the African Cup of Nations games yet? Not yet, although I did see they're all on Sky, so I'll, I'll be checking them out in between uh, the games that's coming up, aye. The BBC have got the later stages of the tournament, I think. Eh? Uh, I mean, mm. I, I watched uh, a game last night and it was, I can't remember, but uh, there was a penalty kick took in it by a guy called Pelly, And it was Guinea Busasa, I think it was. I can't remember. Anyway, it was a penalty kick to a guy called Pele in the 80-setting minute. And I didn't think I was going to see a worse penalty kick than I saw Giorgio's Giacomacus take <laughs> earlier on this season. If anybody can find it on YouTube, it is one of the worst penalty kicks that you'll ever see. It took about five minutes to take it by the time he'd done the run-up. It was absolutely horrendous. And it wasn't even a good save by the goalkeeper. Uh, I watched Algeria, it's a part of the Algeria game yesterday as well, and they tried a quick Celtic League Cup final free kick. And uh, it didn't quite work when you haven't got Kyogo Furahachi actually to <laughs> actually to put the ball into the back of the net. The boys' lob, I think, is still sailing out of Cameroon as we actually speak. <laughs> uh, Sean Curran comes in and goes, that penalty was hilarious. It was, Sean. It was a hilarious penalty kick, and I recommend anybody to actually go and have a look at it. Now, we'll go to the tagline right away. Can Ange Postacoglu convince Riley McGree to choose Celtic over the championship? Uh, so, the story is, it seemed that Riley McGree was going to sign for Celtic for £3 million from FC Charlotte. Now, it looks like Middlesbrough have came in and have gazumped us with, with, with a bid and offered the lad more money if reports are to be believed. Now, we've got to say it is decent reports because it's Stephen McGowan. It actually says mm -hmm. this is what's actually happened. Uh, so, Brian, what's your thoughts on this development? So, it depends how you look at it. And on one hand, I understand why a player might want to go to, um, you know, a club for, for more money. Obviously, he's got a short career. He's looking for the money. But the reality is, if, if he thinks Middlesbrough is a better option than Celtic Football Club to have a successful career, then let him go. I'm, I'm no that... I mean, I don't think our season hinges with whether we sign Riley McKee. I didn't know who he was three weeks ago, so I'm always of the opinion if they don't want to come to Celtic or there's a question whether you want to come to Celtic, then, then stay where you are or go elsewhere. I think, you know... There's no comparison between the clubs in terms of size or support or structure. I think he knows Posta Coglu, he knows what he's going to be doing, he knows about playing. But if he prefers going for the money, you know, good luck to the boy. It's no great losses, I don't think. 
Uh, Colin, what's your thoughts on it as well? Uh, Kev, to be honest, when you look at the deal and the structure of it, Celtic were paying something like £3 million up front with an additional 2 to £3 million in add-ons over the next couple of years. We were offering them £10,000 a week. And then it came out that Middlesbrough had added another £2 million onto that. And that's not just wages, that's these actual transfer fees. You're talking £5 million up front, plus another 2 to £3 million in add-ons, 14 grand a week. As Brian says, for a guy that's not necessarily proven himself at a top level, that money could be spent better off. And do you know what? I think we're all a bit concerned because of how successful the start of this sort of transfer window has been that we've got a lot of business done in the first couple of days. See, normally, 12 days into a January transfer window, we'd still be waiting on our first signing. We'd still be waiting here going, right, are we going to pick this guy up for Dundee United? Are we going to pick this guy up on loan from um, down south? The fact that we've got this work done, I'd rather that money was spent on bringing someone like Jota or Cameron Carter-Vickers in a permanent deal and then look at what else is out there. Obviously, it sounds as if it was an Ange Postacoglu uh, player that had been identified, but he's going to identify another dozen between now and the end of the window. This one didn't happen. Put it to the side, back to the drawing board, start again. We've still got 18 days before the window shuts. It does, it does actually seem that way, Brian. It was a name that was sprung on us. It was almost as if this player became available and we decided to push the button on it. It wasn't one, unlike the unlike the three Japanese lads, one they've been linked with this guy up until Sunday. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's Colin says. Look, I'm always of the opinion, and I was just saying when we were linked to Eddie Howe, and it's no revisionist because they can go back and check the tapes. <laughs> but um, I think, I don't see... I don't ever want Celtic to be bending over backwards for anybody. If they don't want to come to Celtic and they don't want to play in for, for our club, I'm not really that first. There's always someone else, as Colin said. There's always another player wanting to come in. Just because, you know, I think there's a weird narrative in the, the transfer windows when you're looking for a player because it's almost like if we don't get that player, we're not going to get any other player. But Colin says, I mean, remember when Fury Hashi came in? That came right at the blue. No one knew anything about it. No one, we were only linked to him. He just appeared in our doorstep and what a signing that was. So if we don't get McKee, we'll get someone else. Um, and I've no doubt they'll be, they'll be just as good. But as Colin says, you know, five million up front and then add on to seven million for an unknown prospect. I'd rather spend five million on a uh, six million on Jota, who's, a, you know, who's excellent. So, so for me, Riley McKee is a non-entity at the moment. As you know, I've seen his clips on YouTube, he looks like a good player, but I don't see why we should sacrifice or, or go begging to anybody. As Colin says, those figures are actually quite... They're a bit on the large side for us to bring somebody in, unlike Jota and Cameron, Cameron, Cameron Carter Vickers, who have actually proved themselves. Adam Beanie-Smith is not down to Ange to convince McGree uh, if he's been offered more money and a better contract, that suits him. And Charlotte probably getting a higher selling fee with Middlesbrough. Now, that's it. If football deals are not simple. Transfer deals are not simple. There's always things that can come in. It's like kind of buying a house. And if you're selling a house and trying to buy a house at the same time, all your ducks need to be in a row before, before the sale goes through. John Sweeney, if you have to convince a player to choose between Celtic or Middlesbrough, then he is not the player for us. I would go for Ryan Hedges of Aberdeen for the midfield. Colin, you're the state of Scottish football expert between the three years. What do you think of John Sweeney's shout there of Ryan Hedges of Aberdeen? Ryan Hedges has always been someone that's impressed me when he's played for Aberdeen. The only problem that he's got is he's had um, quite a few injury issues over the last couple of years. Um, he broke into the Aberdeen team and really, when he wasn't in it, they didn't play well at all. He's kind of coming to, I think he's maybe 25, 26. It's that sort of awkward stage. He's available for roughly about 150 grand. That was the last bid that was put in for Blackburn for him. Is he someone that's going to come in and make an impact? Probably not into the first team. It could be a good squad option, but I think Celtic will probably be looking for players that will push, push people into the first team instead of just developing the squad at this stage. Maybe later in the window, if he's still available, I wouldn't be surprised if we make that move. This this is, I've got to bring a comment by Maravte at 25 here. If McCree's not 100% committed, walk away. Ange won't pander to anyone. And that that's where that that's where we all are, eh? Then he pander him. If he wants to go to Middlesbrough, wants to go to Smoggyland, let him go. 
no great mm-hmm. loss. This is a better project. If he wants to come mm-hmm. come here, Celtic Football Club will be the best place in the world where he'll ever play football. And if he doesn't want to get that, it's his loss, as far as I'm concerned. See, the thing is as well, Kev, Charlotte don't care. Charlotte no, have picked this guy up no. for next to nothing from the A-League and they're going to make about £5 million on him. So mm. they, they don't care where the money's coming from. They, they had no idea what kind of player he was going to be in America. They just wanted to... They saw the investment opportunity and took it. I mean, you, I'm going to come to Brian with this. John Sweeney mentioned that Ryan Hedges is there, a, a domestic signer. Uh, over the last couple of days, we, we, we've been linked with the, the, four, the aforementioned McCree. We've also uh, been linked with Maihede Gaide from Al Ali, who's an Iranian striker. There's different reports on that, whether it's on or off, or whether it was just made up or pie in the sky. <coughs> We're the three Japanese strikers as well, right? So we we are recent signings and rumoured signings no coming for European leagues. Has our transfer policy changed and has that made it easier to get players in so far? What do you think of that, Brian? Or is it just the fact that Posta Coglu's there and he's got a wider knowledge of worldwide football than maybe our scouting department? I think you I think you saw it changing at the start of the season in terms of the deals we were doing. You know, the, the longer deals, you know, five years, four and a half years, whatever it was, and um, want to buy options. It was a cleverer way of doing business this year. And I think, you know, continuing that theme of cleverness, I think the reason we're sending these players from say Japan and possibly Iran or, or, or whatever is the fact that they're in their pre season. You know, their season's finished and they're ready to go. It's not mid-season where they start to negotiate and they're doing loan deals at the end of the window because the players aren't going to play. There's players who are up to speed, who are ready to go, who can hopefully march straight into the team and make a difference. So in that regard, it's clever enough. And I think that's post the doing because it seems to suggest that, you know, Maeda, Hitati, um, Gucci are, um, are basically up and ready to go. There's no bedding them in. They're, they're ready up and running. They're probably confident for their respective successes. So in that regard, it's good buys. And the, the, the deal for those three was very good financially as well. And you've got the knock-on effect of hopefully publicity in Japan to, to bump that up. So really good business. Um, so I'm hoping the transfer strategies... Well, it's changed for previous years already. I hope it's a trend that continues moving forward. I think the other aspect that's really pleasing is... We're getting these players in just now so that when we get to the Champions League qualifiers, if we need to use them, we can go straight to it. The squad's settled, they're ready to go, they're up to speed. It's no... Gonna, you know, I don't think Posta Coglu ever wants to be in a situation he was at the start of this season where he's having to just throw a team together and hope they can qualify. So I, I suspect moving forward that certainly when he's in charge, you see this sort of proactive approach to transfers. Um, and, and just... Quickly on the subject to Ryan Hedges, is see any better than what we've got at the club at the moment? I don't see so. And I think we should only really be signing players at the moment who are better. Um, <laughs> yeah, quite excellent. But I'm pretty, um, I, I, I don't think we should be signing anybody that's, that's a squad player just now. I think we should only be looking for players that are better or as good as what we've got because then that's competition for places. And you get better quality coming through it. I think signing squad players or other SPL players to supplement, I don't think it's the way to go, especially when we've got the issues of the pathway for the academy. You know, there's no point in signing a, a Ryan Hedges if it puts a, a younger player in a, a position. Studs Lanigan comes in with a comment. Um, I'm pretending I never heard anybody mentioning Ryan Hed- Hedges. Do you, Colin, do you agree with, with Brian there that it is going to be a long term change of policy? You, you had an, you had an I mean, interesting. You had an interesting take that we found it easier to sign the Japanese players because their league has finished. Yeah, that, that's what we were saying. We were, we were obviously speaking about this on WhatsApp a couple of days ago. When you look at it, the markets that we're targeting right now, it is where the seasons are over. So when you look at it, if you have to replace a key player in the summer, you've got a longer window to do so. If you lose an Edward in the summer, you've got a longer window to bring in a Kyogo. Whereas in January and whenever the sort of mid-season break is for the rest of the leagues that play summer football, they still only have 30 days. And if you want to try and replace quality with quality, 
it's very, very difficult to do so unless you spend ridiculous amounts of money. And that's when you see in the English Premier League when it gets to the likes of right now and you look at Newcastle who have so much money to spend and they're about to go and spend £20 million on Chris Wood because they're just throwing money at the idea of trying to survive. The ex so, Rangers goalie. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> the ex Rangers goalie. That's a Celtic dad joke, that one. Chris Wood. That's Callan. What are you kids going to do? It's Colin went muted or we. He was fooled by that joke there. <laughs> that, that, the worst bit was uh, Brian I never even heard it that was the worst bit I'm going to have to drop out and come back in but like, the, the point they, being made is there's money that gets spent on ridiculous transfer fees when teams are needing to try and bring it in whereas in the summer you don't see that as much mm-hmm. as Colin drops out it is true what Colin says I mean, we, we, we had Riley McGree comes for the, the MLS Saudi Arabia as well are in the middle of a winter, a, a summer break. I think it will be there. Well, their season's actually finished. The Japanese lads' seasons are finished as well. It's easier to deal with those clubs, Brian, at this point than what it is to deal with clubs in Europe who are in the middle, who are in, in the middle of their seasons. Foster Coglu says that in the interview that he done at the weekend, he, he's welcome back interview that he done for the Celtic fans when he was wishing us all happy new year. He actually says that he knew it was going to be virtually impossible to get the Japanese guys that he wanted in August because they wouldn't sell because they, they were in the middle of their season. Eh? So why has nobody else ever thought about let's have a look, have a look at the leads, have a look at leads <laughs> leagues whose season has finished when, when, we're in the, when we're in January. It seems fairly obvious now, but I, can't, I, don't, I mean, the thing about it is we, we, for a long time, really took advantage of markets that people wanted to really shop in. You know, sort of, um, you know, we look at, picked up guys like Wanyama and stuff like that. We looked at Belgium leagues, some of the Dutch leagues, some of the more unusual leagues, and we got players from there. Um, Scandinavian leagues we, we picked up players from there and then other clubs started doing that when they saw the successes we were having so we've had to kind of constantly well, there you go Brown Warrior um, and we've had to kind of constantly evolve but for a while we were trying to do the same things over and over and we were getting the scraps because the, the star players from the leagues were away so I think as well as the fact that it's Angie's background it's also an evolution of the markets we are shopping in and if you look at the, the, the fees paid for and Look, we're assuming Maeda, Hitati and Gucci are going to do a job for us. And we have to say, based on, you know, Kyogo signing and Postacoglu's faith in these players, they probably will. Look at the fees we play for them, they're tiny. And if you look at the boy McKee, we're talking about three million up front, the add-ons up to five or six million. Whereas we're getting, you know, Maeda for what, a couple of million, 1.2 million or something. Uh-huh. Gucci for 700 grand. I mean, that's just better business. We've got three players for the price we play for this boy in the Cree. So as well as the, the fact that the, the practical sense of the season's finished, they're up to speed, it's also the fact that we're getting good deals for, for players that should and hopefully will make a difference. And the fact that these are players that post So Postacoglu's style and his system is so intense that we've seen players kind of really cope with it. We've heard rumours that McCarthy's been struggling with training. That will mean the actual games. Mm-hmm. Well, most of all, the signing players it's players he thinks can come in play train and you know sort of become the type of players he needs for his system to be successful and you've got your faith that they're going to see these players coming in and I think that's another way just come back to the boy Hedges something signing these guys and look at your Liam Shaw's your Uruguides they seem good buys on paper if they're not going to fit in it the way the manager wants to play and train and the type of players he needs that really, really strong athleticism, that endless stamina, that off the wall press. What's the point of bringing them in? We need to have complete faith in, in post and the players he's picking, I think. See, truthfully, if you're asking me truthfully, is there anybody in Scottish football I see that would want to sign for Celtic? The answer is no. And I don't think losing anybody, unless. I, 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 I haven't seen any young town or any established town that I, fight, I have a look at that Celtic team and go, I can see him in that Celtic side. David Turnbull was different. David Turnbull was completely different. Sorry, Colin. I would say Calvin Ramsey, Aberdeen. I, I think, think that ship's already sailed. I, I, I think, think that ship's already sailed. 
that goes oh. back to the early point as well. Is, it, is he going to... I mean, he's, he would have said he's better than Austin at the start of the season, but is he better than Austin now? I, I don't think so. And he's certainly no better than Juravic. So again, the £4 million pound for a guy that is going to be third choice. Surely we've got B-squad players that could be a third choice right back. You see what I mean? I just don't think he's going to come in and re- re- replace. Um, but I mean, you're right about the fact that he could mm. fit in a Celtic team. I just don't think he fits in any this Celtic team. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only one that stands out, it's not really this season. Last season, the boy McCann for St. Johnson. Mm-hmm. He stood out. Uh, he was. I thought he looked a, 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 quite a good player and I thought he was someone who fitted in. This season, I can't think there's anybody off hand that I thought, oh, we should be signing him. What about um, Josh Doig from Hibs? Nah. Again, I don't see him being better than... I don't think he was any better than Taylor, even when he was playing well. Um, and Scales looks as if he's, he's, he's you know, pretty good cover. I actually, I actually don't know there's much between Scales and Taylor. I, I still think we actually need a, a, a sort of higher level left-back, if I'm honest. But again, boy, like Doyd, he's going to come in. I don't think he's better than what we've got. Is he potentially... Is Montgomery get better, potentially, as a third left-back? Are they guys in the B team? Again, I just don't see what if we want the club and what a post to call the said about the academy as well and how important he sees that. I just I feel like they're the guys that are going to be you know third choices, then maybe second choices and bring in as opposed to buying guys for the league that they unless they've got crazy potential like a Turnbull, like the boy McCann we spoke about that really stand out. I, I don't anybody. I mean, I don't know if they play in the league and they might play if think or they can maybe be, be decent, but for me. Not, 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 nothing stood out this season for me. Regard, regarding Dodge for me, Colin, I couldn't understand what the fuss was about in the first place. Uh, he had a lot of potential, but as what we spoke about on Sunday, if we see Adam Montgomery having a pathway into the Celtic side as, mm-hmm. as a left back, then just signing Dodge just puts another obstacle in front of Adam Montgomery becoming our first choice left back when we actually see him being ready to be be a left-back. Why did you say Duck Dodge there? What, what made him pop into your head? What was well, that? When you look at the talent, I mean, if you were looking, obviously, honestly, at Scottish football, we did a, um, a team of 2021, and you could only pick so many players from each team so that you could have a variety throughout the team. And the first choice at left-back for everybody was, was Doig. Mm. And when you look at it, I think he is someone who is a very promising left-back. I know what you're saying about Adam Montgomery. Personally, I don't see Adam Montgomery being the first-choice long-term left-back at Celtic because I don't think it's his position, to be perfectly honest. I don't see him being the one. Now, you look at like Tierney, they're, they're both a quite similar build when they first came into the team, but Tierney had to sort of bulk up big time to deal with the sort of press that would come down the right-hand side towards him. He would throw himself into tackles. He would be able to kind of get past the tackles and get himself back up. And you've seen, obviously, the effect that's had on him and the amount of games that he's missed for both Celtic, Arsenal and, and Scotland over the years because of some of the tough tackles that he's made. But that is Scottish football. And I don't know if Adam Montgomery is going to be cut out for stuff like that. What I have seen from Doidge so far, and it's, we've got to be careful, it's Doig, not Doidge, because both Doig, of them play but, for, aye, so for Hibs, and they're to- two totally different players. Um, but what I've seen from Doig is he's not scared to kind of commit into that, and he's very good in the attacking sense, which I think suits an Ange Postacoglu team. I'm not 100% sure if that's what you'll see from Montgomery going forward. What we did speak about, though, on Sunday, and I think is something that we do have to look at is... If he is going to be the first choice going forward, we have to start looking at where we can put him out in Scottish football to give him some loan time. Definitely. I'm going to come to that later on in the programme uh, regarding players going out on loan. We were speaking about the long term there, Colin, and you made a great you made a great pitch for, for Doy to actually be to to join Celtic there. We'll, we'll clip that so me and Brian have maybe proved wrong later <laughs> when he when he signs when he signs for a uh, Man United for hundred and twenty five million pounds or something like that after like uh, it'll show it will show that me and Brian know nothing about football. Sean F comes in this is this is just breaking news seemingly uh, afternoon acts on panel and chat. Just seen the news today that we're adding Benfica and a Benfica an analyst to our sports science team. Similarly brought in for player recruitment and opposition analysis. 
it's good to see if that's true that Ange Postacoglu's influence is coming in again and we're, and we're filling another gap that needs filled in the back, Brian. Yeah, it just gives you faith that this stuff's growing in the background. You know, we can't always be... We talk a lot of time about, you know, wanting to know what's going on, what's going on in the background and stuff. I mean, we can't always be privy to that because there's interviews growing and, you know, you, you know <clears throat> if you say they'll have a link to this guy, you don't know who it was. So I think, um, I think it's good that there's progress being made. And I think it's good that it's been made, you know, sort of further afield and different ideas and, and things coming in. And yeah, it just gives me really good faith that Post Hulk is really steering the ship and he's in control of what's going on and he's bringing these players in. Um, and I think that it's, you know, we'll not see the effect of this until further down the line in terms of recruitment and stuff. But it goes back to the point earlier about the evolution of our recruitment process. The fact we've got guys like this coming in can only be a good thing. Sean F comes in and says the Benfica analysis is Anton Ortega. Sounds like a right mafia dude, that one. I quite, I love that name, actually. <laughs> Anton Ortega. Uh, kind of guy you phone to get a job done. Colin, what do you think of this? This, this is another positive move in the post of Coggle either, eh? I was just looking him up there. Um, <clears throat> apparently he graduated with a Master's in Data Science from the University of Paris. Um, and he's worked as a firm called Smart Coach, who's a football data scientist. So it's uh, definitely the kind of analytics route that a lot of people have been asking for Celtic to go down. And it was something that was mentioned a way back as far as um, when Don McKay came in as the CEO for the short period at the start of the season. And we were speaking about the sort of rebuild of the recruitment side of things and focusing on the uh, the teams like Brentford, like Benfica, like Porto, teams like that, um, and how you've got to try and follow the, the structure that they've been doing in the past, and that not only helps our youth development, but it helps our, our first team recruitment. Um, and I go back to when I had the, the chance to sit uh, to sit down with Ange Postacoglu on the fan media conference a couple of months ago, and the question that I got to ask him was about what his plans were for the future um, in terms of recruitment on and off the park. And he said that was a key focus for him. And the fact that you've went and you've skewered Europe to try and bring in someone like this, someone with such a high pedigree, suggests that it's not something that we've just, he's put a job advert out there and the first person on Indeed.com's replied and got the job. This is someone that they've actually scouted out and uh, they've went through a, a kind of, a strict process with it and I hope that we do see it because as I mentioned last week the last time that we actually had someone who was a benefit to our recruitment team was John Park and that's gone back almost 10 years the people that's come in since then have failed almost every single time you've managed to get the odd one or two that's came in from Celtic in the recruitment times that we've turned around but the rest of it's all been guys that we've already seen with our own eyes. There's never been the, the likes of John Park going out and picking up a Virgil van Dijk or a, a one Yama and we've turned it around. Guys like Foster were already on our radar when we picked him up. Edward, we, we spotted alongside Dembele playing in the, the next-gen series yeah. that we spoke about the other day, Kevin. So actually having someone with an experience in the European market alongside the experience that Andrew's got in the Asian market it's adding to a world sort of scouting system and considering what we spoke about earlier on about picking players up at the right time of the season that's that can only be a benefit for us going forward I'm going to bring up Patrick Dolan's comment here we are littered with bad buys and I think Colin that just highlights the fact since John Park left there seems to have been a pick and mix of a signing we've signed a lot of players on little potential actually from teams that I mean I asked you on, on Sunday, can you remember who we signed Bio from? Can you remember the team that we said that we signed Kamala from? They, they weren't household names. They, they were they were teams in the lower reaches of, of leagues that are not even extremely popular in their own countries, never mind in Europe. Uh, so Patrick Dolan, we are littered with bad buys. Problem is that every acquisition is based on potential. Fit is the key. Let Ange decide who comes in and who is loan and punted. Brian, for the last since since Brendan Rodgers clacks on at twenty nine thirty nine here, uh, mm. Brendan Rodgers left. We have had no rhyme or reason with our signings whatsoever. 
it's been a bit of pick and mix, a pick of, a bit of going back to certain agents. It's time that changed, then. Eh? Absolutely. I've been harping on since the start of the season about teams like Brentford and the recruitment and you know clubs like Salzburg and things like that and how they use analytics basically to recruit. Their policy, I think, um, Salzburg's is they they need to be like under twenty three, fit certain criteria for physicality, athleticism, hit all these metrics, and neither type of players that are going to fit a Salzburg system in the way they play. So the risk is mini- minimised because unless their attitude is particularly bad, every metric suggests they'll fit the system. But we've not recruited that ever. But no. hopefully, given the fact that this guy for Benfica, Mister Ortega, is um, <laughs> he's going to be coming in using this analysis, the open men that Celtic are actually going to start developing this continuity of play, because that's going to be key for us. When I watched some of the um, the match day the Celtic you, you lads were on. He's been um, looking resplendent in the studio. By the way, it was a very good watch. But um, the, the, the good thing about that is you talk about the pathways. And you mentioned Brendan Rodgers, and I mentioned it to you in our group chat. When Brendan Rodgers was sending guys like local flicks, he saw local flicks fitting his system and his team at some point. That's why he was signed. He was sending academy players based on he'll fit the way I play. Then Lenny comes in, and if they're not drinking iron brew and eating kebabs, he's not interested. So the, the, the fact is, these guys that Brendan Rodgers signed weren't they good for how Neil Lennon wanted to play. And then the guys that Neil Lennon signed to the academy are, that are there, might not be any good. For Ange Postacoglu. So what we need is over the next few years, if Postacoglu starts signing youth players like this boy, the boy Kenny signed um, from Cyglo, if he's coming in, that should in theory um, allow him to then progress if we keep the same sort of system. But if you know Postacoglu when he eventually leaves, which he will, you know, oh, hopefully a long time from now, but he will leave at some point. And then some days within me completely different ideas, you haven't to scrap almost your entire academy system unless there's a couple that benefit that manager but if we've got the continuity and we're signing players based on this style of play based on these metrics the, the risk goes considerably lower and we can afford to take risk by players whereas to your point before we were just throwing money at the wall we're signing 10 players and hope one was good you know we're spending 12 million pounds on 10 players and hope we can sell one for 13 million it was crazy so hopefully we'll start to see the early signs that these things can change moving forward. And Brian, you mentioned that, it, that signing players to fit a certain style and system. Whoever thought Albi and Aete would fit any sort of football team system whatsoever when, when they actually decided to fork out £5 million for them. Uh, Colin, um, what, what, what's your What's your thoughts on, on uh, signing? We, there has to be, there has to be a, a definite fit of player that we need to sign eh? and mm-hmm. this, and we just kind of keep on chucking good money after bad and that we have to have con a new in the background and that's something that we mentioned on Sunday that a, a rival Rangers seem to have that con a new in the background no matter who's in charge No definitely and I think you're now starting to see the foundations of that being put down um, that this guy is uh, been brought in, Ortega been brought in and he's been brought in for a reason and I've seen the comments there saying um, you take a look at it then it has to be that Ange is the one that goes out and picks the players now, I, I do agree with that to an extent because he's the one that's going to coach them he's the one that's going to mould them into the players that he needs to be going forward but he does need support he can't keep doing this 24-7 because if he runs himself into the ground 24-7 doing stuff like this and he, he picks up an injury, he picks, not, sorry, he doesn't pick up an injury, picks up an illness, he's forced away from the game for a period of time, then who's there to sort of fill in that gap? You can only hope that his wisdom's been passed on to his coaching staff that he's got there, and we can speak about whether it was his coaching staff or it was forced upon him, um, till the cows come home, to be perfectly honest, but he's been working with them, and he's bringing his own men in, slowly but surely. He is a football coach at the end of the day, he is someone that, if he signed 10 great players but couldn't get them to play in a system, then we'd be slaughtering them. He, you've got to find the right balance in there as well. It's great that he's been able to identify these players, but at the end of the day, it's the performances on the park that's going to matter. So he could go and spend another £20 million in this window and we could finish the same amount of points that we do behind, but we've brought in great players and it's just been a number of things. People would still be starting to question him. 
there's got to come a point where Ange Postecoglou's main focus is on the players that are on the training ground and the game that comes up on the Saturday, the Wednesday, or whenever it is. And he knows that he's got someone in the background that he can say, oh, do you know what? That's James Forrest out for six months. I need somebody to come in. Let's get together and we'll, we'll kind of we'll put a, a list together and we'll go through it instead of just him going, I need to do this myself then. Aye, we need to get to that point, Colin. You're absolutely spot on there. Ange Poster Coglu can I be CEO, sporting director, PR director, buy the pies, sing the theme tune, all, all of that nonsense. <laughs> eh? we'll, have, we'll have to actually, we'll have to actually move on from that and let Poster Coglu do what he's actually paid to do, which is give us a successful winning and entertaining football team. Sean F, no more bloody doo-doo Durans. Well, he did, he did actually give us a Lee Labada this summer. He, he was his agent. And Sean Curran, before we move on here, says, the majority of our signings were through the Sooty Group. Uh, were through, no, the Sooty Group, man. Where did that come from? The majority of our signings were through the City Group. Sean, so was our manager. <laughs> so, now... The big news yesterday, big news yesterday, that fans are back in stadiums from Monday. The Scottish Government announced that crowds with no restrictions are allowed for next Monday, the day that we play Hibs. Uh, fans are required to be fully vaccinated or have a negative LFT test in the previous 24 hours before the game. I must admit, Celtic Park under the disco lights on a Monday night has never sounded so good, truthfully. So... After a three weeks of nonsense, the question has to be, the SPFL's decision to bring forward the winter break, has it been utterly vindicated? And if your club didn't want the winter break brought forward, does your club actually hate football fans? Brian, I'll go to you first. Uh, I don't know if they hate football fans, I think they hate pressure. Um, just to clarify, by the way, I was joking about Neil Lennon feeding players kebabs at Ryan Brew, a big fan of Lennon. Just, I, get, I see people getting quite upset when I made the joke. I called Barkas hologram hands last week and I get slaughtered, so <laughs> it's just a it's just a wee gag, folks, relax. Um, but in terms of fans coming back, it's brilliant news, isn't it? Can't wait. It's, and I think that, you know, we, we called for a common sense approach from the Scottish Government and the SPFL, and it seemed like a miracle. But it, 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 you've got to say it has worked. It, it made sense. And it has been vindicated, and as you say, disco lights on the Monday night. Just can't wait to get back and 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 see fans at the ground again, and, and see football again. Because I know we've been watching the Premier League, but you miss Scottish football. You know, you obviously miss the Celtic, but you know, you, you miss the, the drama and the things you talk about and stuff. So I can't wait for it to get back. Chris M comes in to remind us, Colin, it's been two years of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, what's your thoughts? Are you looking forward to Monday night? I am absolutely buzzing for Monday night. Um, just getting back into the swing of things. I mean, I, I don't know if Chris Boyd knows that the game's been played on Monday night because he's still trying to work out in his head when these games will get fit back into the schedule. But <laughs> we are playing on Monday night. and Chris Boyd can't explain the schedule. Ah, well, that is the exciting thing, is that we've now got a start date that we can look forward to. That winter break was brought in by the SPFL years ago and it made sense at the time because you look at the kind of weather that we've had over that sort of period and generally that time is absolutely shocking in terms of call-offs because of waterlogged pitches or snow uh, and things like that. Unfortunately, because of things like global warming, that's sort of pushed back a bit as well. So uh, don't be surprised if there's still games called off in February because of snow. That's just the way that Scotland teams to be over the last sort of five, ten years. But when you've got that flexibility to move it and you've got the potential to limit the impact on fans of getting to the ground, it just it made the most amount of sense in the world just to say, Do you know what, let's limit the amount of uh, games that fans are going to miss this season because they've already missed 12 months, 16 months of it before. Why does it have to be like that? Now, I, I can understood the argument that well, we, nobody knows where the world's going to be in three weeks' time. It could have been worse. It could have been um, a million times better. The, the, the fact of the matter is, you've just got to take that chance. You've got to take that risk and see what happened. We rolled the dice and it came up two sixes and we're all back on Monday night. What, where can the complaints come from? Just to, if you were against it at the time, all you need to do now is put your hands up and say, look, 
we're so we were wrong. It's fine. We'll move on. Don't come out like Ross County and say as if you were the saviors of the day and say it's great to have you back when they couldn't care about the fans in the first place. They wanted to lock them out the ground just so they could get the games on. It's it's pathetic that there's still arguments going on all about this. It was a great thing that was done by Scottish football, and I think we'll see the benefit of it towards the end of the season. It does. John McFarlane comes in and says it's going to be rocking. Paddy Laverty says, Sooty the sweeper keeper. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's one for people who grew up in the 1980s. Uh, and I, I'm just having a look. Uh, there was another, loads of comments saying they're all looking forward to going back to paradise. Uh, I there is. Patrick Harold can't wait to go back to pa- paradise. And Patrick is modelling the 1991, 1992, Three. 1993, is it? Celtic jersey, which was designed by St. Duffer of George. Actually, yeah. that Celtic top was designed 90, by... 93 jersey, did we wore that against Hibs the day I was born. Oh, did we? There we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, a bit of Colin Watt trivia there. Yeah. Drew now, one each at Easter Road. Drew one each at Easter Road. Who scored for Celtic? I couldn't tell you. Ah, you've let yourself down there. You've let yourself down there. You've let yourself down there, mate. Let myself down. I'm going to call this bit not the 10 o'clock news. And we're going to have a wee look at the rumours that are actually going on round about uh, Celtic. And the the rumours and also the news that's going round about Celtic at this precise moment in time. So you mentioned it earlier on, Brian, Johnny Kenny signing from Sligo Rovers. I'm going to ask you this question. So we've signed off for Sligo Rovers, and how can we develop him and Joey Dawson for the first team? Right. Well, I think that it comes into <laughs> what we spoke about earlier, but the, the academy and the sort of this pathway we're, we're hoping is going to be there. I think one of the refreshing things about senior B team um, is the fact that they've been playing, you know, very much like a sort of lesser version than than. Uh, Angie's first team, so you can see there's a, a partner play there. You can see they're training the same way, playing the same way. So in theory, if these guys are doing it, he likes what he sees. They should be able to slot straight in, um, and you can only assume that's why he's been signed. He's, he's obviously someone to kept an eye on. He's brought it up, and he must see enough in him that he can, you know, fit fit the system and fit that way of playing. And again, I think it's a really exciting sign, and not maybe not necessarily for just now. I mean, we for years said it for potential signings or sign this guy for the future and he sits in his ears for two years and then goes to you know Hibs it just never happens um, but hopefully with a guy like Kenny it's a sign that actually will bring this guy in so that he will make the step up in say a, a year or so he will be the testing ground I think for where we, we see this pathway under Postacoglu and if there's one because it seems like he's been signed for it so so fingers crossed I just, got a, I just had a, a quick check I had a rough idea of who it was, but I didn't want to be wrong. It's not Paul McStay. Is it not Paul McStay? It's no. not. It was uh, Jerry Creaney with a late equaliser at Easter Road. It was one of Frank Connor's unbeaten run. So it was one of the four games that he went unbeaten. It was a one-each draw at Easter Road. Wow. See, when you actually mention that away top, I actually do picture Jerry Creaney in that top. That mm. bagginess. And, and so... Aye, aye, Jerry Craney, there's another striker that could have been massive for us, could have been great for us, but slipped away at a time of utter confusion and mentalness at Celtic Park, in the, which was Celtic Park in the early 90s, actually. Brian spoke there, Colin, about how we can develop uh, Johnny Kenny and Joey Dawson for the first team. They've got two strikers in front of them. Albie and Aieti's time looks like it's going to be running out at Celtic, but Giorgio Giacomacus was pictured running about uh, at training over the last week. How does Giacomacus fit into the new look Celtic since Maeda, Furahashi and Yota are, are our favoured front three? I mean, just on the Jerry Craney thing, it's an interesting kind of look at it. You're speaking about Kenny and Dawson coming through strikers. Some would argue that Craney was the last big striker that we actually brought through as a youth player. I mean, you're talking maybe Sean Maloney and that, but was he ever not an, an out-and-out number nine? Craney was. Um, so that topic kind of is very relevant to that discussion about him scoring the day I was born and then th- these guys coming through. So Alanis Morissette would say it was ironic. Um <laughs> On this kind of idea or a, of, script, or, a, or a scripted segue, Colin. 
This is just proving the fact that we're not told what to say because I'm just talking rubbish here. Um, you look at it, but and you're mentioning guys like Yakimatis. He is the sort of plan B that I don't think we've seen from Celtic this season. I mean, I don't think he's been great in his performances, but he's only had one or two. Uh, now, that game against Livingston was the epitome of someone who was playing on absolute zero confidence. He should never have been given that penalty uh, to take late on. The amount of chances and the amount of sort of loose balls that he had in that game, it just didn't suit him. He was sort of, it wasn't bullied off the park, but he didn't ever get himself into it. So I don't know why giving someone a penalty with almost the last kick of the ball would do anything different to him. He should have just been given to someone who, like Juranovic, had scored only the other day. Yakimatis, mm. when you look at it now, the service that's going to be coming in, we spoke about the two games that he had played. One of them was against Livingston where we put about 40 crosses in. He never got on the end of any of them. He never got on the end of any of them. As someone who is very low on confidence and we need to keep giving him the chances, whether he misses them or takes them. You've just got to keep giving them because he showed that he can do it in the Dutch league beforehand. And I know people will say, well, he scored 12 penalties in that 29 goals. 17 of them weren't. And he's not shown how he can do that for Celtic so far. Even his goal that he did score, he just got himself into the right position. We're going to have a sort of fluid front three going forward of Jota, um, Maeda and Kyogo. And if the pace isn't working and we need an out ball, then Yaka Matis is the guy. And he can play off, that he can hold it up and play the other two in. There is a role for Yaka Matis in this team. It's just maybe not the role that he was used to playing when he was at VVV last year, and it's going to take a bit of time to get him settled in. It'd be kind of wrong to get him written off completely now. I do think if you see him, and I'm not going to kind of compare him to John Hartson, but when you look at when John Hartson signed for Celtic, it took him 10 games to get his first goal. It's, it maybe just takes a wee bit of time for him to settle in. I'd like to see him getting 20 minutes, 30 minutes here and there. Don't throw him back into the starting 11 right away. Let him build up that confidence. Let him get a goal or two and then take it from there. Richard Murray, before I come to Brian, Yakamakis has been discarded by many far too soon. Brian, I thought he had a couple of nice wee cameos when he came off the bench. He held the ball up well. But that, that game against Livingston that, that Colin brings up was one, and I, I'm not going to deny that I say this, the guys that I sit round about at half time, I says at half time, I went, Yaka Marcus looks utterly terrible. He looks well off the pace. He looked like a bio. He, he one of those guys you just saw, you go, he looked like a bio or a middle ball. You go, why are you actually at this football club? And that's what I says. Truthfully, I actually called him a coup <laughs> at the time. But, uh, and I says that, and the, the guys and my supporters boss will pick me up on that if he starts banging in 20, 30 goals a season. So I may as well let the viewers pick me up on it as well if he starts banging in 25 or 30 goals a season. Uh, do you think Yakamakis has been disregarded and forgotten, actually, by a lot of the support already? Possibly. Um, it was interesting, I think it was today or yesterday, maybe, post the call we were chatting to the, the press and he'd said that you know he's not giving up on... on uh, Jackie Marcus, he, he, you know, he, he's been a bit unfortunate, but he still sees him in his plans and he's got to give him a chance. So he's obviously faith in him. So he sees him, seems to know him. And the, the fact is, we've not seen enough of him to decide, I don't think, either way. As Colin said, the game he played against Livingston, he did look short of confidence. But again, the, I think the team was poor that day. I don't think it was just him. So it's, it is really hard to tell at this stage. Um, I, I said, I don't think we can write him off. I think he's got to be a different option to come off the bench. I don't imagine he's going to start loads of games. Um, so we have to give him the time. And the fact that Posta Colgo backs him and he thinks there's potential there, um, you know, I have to sort of buy into it. Because he's not, I mean, he's not going out his way with lavish praise on guys, even guys that are doing really well. Posta Colgo, he's, he's, he's sort of quite pragmatic in his approach. And he seems fairly honest in his assessments of players. He can usually read between the lines of what he thinks, and he seems that he seems to think there's enough up there. 
Um, the other accounts he kind of personally reached out to him to get him in. So I'm hoping, like you, Kev, listen, see if he starts, <coughs> see if he sees rotten and he starts buying in 25 goals. I dare say we'll all be absolutely delighted. Because oh, of course we will. So it doesn't matter. Ultimately, if you, if, you know, I do think to answer the question, he's probably been written off a wee bit early. Um, and now trust Poster Coglu's judgment and it will come good. See, see, the thing is, you, you mentioned Dick Ev that he's looked good in cameo roles where he's been on for 20, 30 minutes. There's players that can make a career out of doing that. You think, oh, it's Solskjaer down at um, Man United? Never really started. Again. Yeah, guys like that who can come off the bench, get themselves into it and get a goal. Now, he's not been able to do that for Celtic so far, but when you look at the sort of way that Ange Postacoglu wants to play football, it's it's not to have Yakimatis as your number nine through the middle because that's not his preferred style. It might be away from home in Europe when you've got your backs to the wall and you need to get the ball out and that's maybe where the games that will start. But see later on in a game when you've run at defences for 70 minutes and they're absolutely knackered, see putting a big body in there and throwing them about, especially from corners and set pieces. You can see him getting goals. It's just that he might not be the guy that's going to start 30 games for Celtic a season. It might be that he's got the specific games he'll come into. There's nothing wrong with that. You'd rather have that option off the bench instead of looking at the bench and going, well, oh, right, who do we come on for? We need to change the game here. Definitely. I mean, we do wish him well, and I fully expect him to see at Recreation Park against Dallow in the Scottish Cup. Um, let's go back to, you mentioned Jerry Craney. Brian Walsh comes in and says, don't forget Mark Butchell. Butchell for a time yeah. was what was the next big thing uh, in the Scottish game. And Stephen Murray comes in to remind us, Jerry Craney scored a belt on the ve- ve- versus the old company in the Scottish Cup. He did that. Craney scored an awful lot of great goals for us. And, and, it, and it, it, is, it just seems to be one of those what-ifs, what might have been for him. Let's talk about guys that are coming through the, the academy. It's came through the academy. There was a rumour that Udinese wanted to take Stephen Welsh on loan to Italy with an option to buy. It was rejected and the rumoured asking price was only one point. £6 million. Now it seems that Poster Coglu has utterly kibosed us and says that Stephen Welch is not going anywhere. So he's not going to be strolling around Sierra like uh, Franco Barese. He's going to be staying in Lennox Town, strolling around Lennox Town like Franco Begbie. So, <laughs> should, <laughs> right, I'll, Colin, I'll come to you first. Should Stephen Welch replace Carr Starfield in the, in the lineup in the next run of games? Because... The stats guys have thrown Cal Starfell in a skip over the, over, over the last couple of days <laughs> with, with our numbers. Cal Starfell has been discarded like an old Christmas tree by the guys who crunch the numbers in the Celtic fandom site. So I'm asking the question, should Stephen Welsh play instead of Cal Starfell? Now, the, the first game up is Hibs. And Hibs are going to come at Celtic with um, a new kind of approach considering the new manager brought in and Sean Maloney and what I've seen out of them so far is he is uh, someone who likes to utilise the pace down the, the sides and in behind when I think back to any time Stephen Welsh has came up against a, a quick striker this season he has struggled I'm thinking the way back at the start of the season um, when he came up against Mikel Antonio in the West Ham game he was torn apart the, the goal that he conceded against Livingston his positioning was wrong to get in behind him. Overall, Stephen Welsh's performances probably have earned him a slot in the Celtic team to let himself kind of win the jersey. But I just think the experience of Starfelt, and it is slightly quicker that when you've got the likes of Martin Boyle and Kevin Nisbet coming at you on Monday night, it's just that extra layer of protection. Um... Do you know what? See, considering some of the options that we may or may not have, I wouldn't be surprised eventually if we see the three of them playing. But uh, Starfelt, Welsh and um, Cameron Carter-Vickers. I, I do think eventually we might see that in a change to the formation, a bit like what we played against St Johnston just before the break there. So if that's the case, then maybe the three of them start. 
Uh, Brian, before we come to you, Joe Porter makes a really, really valid and a perfect point. Welsh is, mo- is worth more to the team than 1.6 million. There's already precedent set for backup defenders going for £116 million pounds to the English Premiership, Brian. So what do you think? Do you think Welsh should should be looking at a first-team spot? Aye, absolutely. This is where Colin and I have a normal disagreement because <clears throat> I think I think Welsh is, is a much better option than Starfield with the back. I think that his passing is better. I think he's he's a he's a bit more aggressive at set pieces, defender and attacking. Um he's not quite as quick, that's true, but Starfield for me looks clumsy at times. You know, he he has got a weird style of tackling, he almost he gets tangled up there and sort of does last minute tackles in and I think Starfield is a good player, but for me, just Welsh, I've yet to see him really have a bad game. He's had moments of lapses. You know, I think Starfield's probably just as many or more. Um, and do you know what? I like the fact that he's a youth player. I like the fact he's a Celtic man. He's came through, and I think we should be embracing that. And I think, you know, to go to uh, Joe's point, 1.6 is a scandal. If you were to sell him for 1.6 million, whoever does it needs a slap because he's worth far more than that. There's no way we should be selling him for that amount. Um, and as I say, for me, I, I would have him alongside Carter Vickers first. I think he's he's very vocal as well. He, he, he talks to us through games. You saw that kind of at the start of the season when we were sort of weaker defensively and we didn't have the players in at the time. He really stepped up for me. And, he, you know, I think that he can play sort of back three like he did against St. Johnston. He could play sort of at the right of the back three. Um, but for me, he's younger than Starfield. He's got a lot more potential, I think. I think at the moment, he's just as good or better. So I would have him in um, before Starfield. The real question will be if Julian comes back, who drops out? Ah, I see another scripted segue there, Brian. Another yeah. scripted segue. I was looking at my I was looking, I was getting pinged over it. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, interesting with you with, with Julian, because Julian always played in the right of the, a two man defence. And that, it's, CCV from his command has been pretty strictly put in the right uh, the right hand side. So is he gonna to go to left and Julian comes back into his right hand berth or is Julian gonna to go to the left side? And is he gonna come in and directly replace Welsh and Starfield? That's an interesting discussion because I think he he's the most different defender we've got. You know, he's certainly the tallest. He offers a lot of aerial threat. He's not the greatest physically. I think he gets caught up in things at times. Um, but he is fast for his size as well, to Colin's point about, you know, because Carter Vickers is brilliant, but he's not the quickest. So is Julian and Carter Vickers a better partnership? That would be interesting. Well, Brown Warrior comes in. Starfelt panics too much for me and can he handle a big striker? Gets bullied too easily and needs to grow a set. Now, the same accusation was levelled at Christopher Julian Colin when he, when, when he played when he played with us, especially when he came up against uh, London Dykes. Since he's been out, he's actually became a cross between Beckenbauer, Maldini and Bobo Baldi. It's, it's old adage, the more a player doesn't play, the better that he actually gets. Can you see Christopher Julien walking back into this team? No. No, he's been out far too long. It's just far too much of a risk. I know I, I was seen in the comment section today that Celtic's playing a game behind closed doors at the minute. It'd be interesting right. to see if Chris Julian's currently playing in that. But how can you throw someone in just like that? Especially when the last time we did it, he lasted three games and then he was out for 12 months. It's just far too much of a risk. You don't know what kind of player he's became in the time that he's been off. I, I seen him on TikTok getting a haircut the other day suggesting that he's ready to get back into playing football. <laughs> But I've not seen him on a training pitch. I've not seen him playing any sort of minutes. I'm not going to throw a guy like that into what is potentially a massive game for Celtic on Monday night. We cannot afford to drop any points. Hibs are going to come out there and they're going to have a right good go at us. We need people that are ready for the fight. And I'm not sure that Chris Julian is ready for the fight yet. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see him until, I don't know, maybe the next time we play St Mirren or Dundee. But yeah, I think before he comes back as well, I think. <clears throat> um, yeah, he, he certainly doesn't. Well, he's not. Well, not. He's done nothing on merit to to want him, him dropping the place. I think he's going to have to be patient. Whether it's, I mean, we're, we're assuming CCV doesn't get dropped because he's been 
the most consistent. So we're looking at the Welsh or Starfield dropout, and as much as I've, I don't have been overly critical of Starfield, but I don't think any of them merited being dropped at the moment. So I, well, I've got to agree with Colin on that one. I don't see Julian back in, I think. There's a fight in his hands. Um, but again, it all depends on what he does in the training field and how much Ange thinks he fits his system and how much he he's at that he sees in him ultimately. <coughs> Joe McCauley, last comment of today. Do you all forget that Star- Starfelt was classed two months before he got injured? Aye, he was rubbish at first, but after he got adjusted adjusted to the pace of the Scottish game, he wasn't letting anything past. He's only just back from said injury too. That that is that is a point as well that we've got to take on board. And I'm sure the guilt the lads in the dressing room and the coaching staff will have all the answers for us on Monday night when we're back talking about football. I just want to thank you all for watching and listening. You you really are all the best of human beings. And just tune in to a state of mind for loads of other great content like the live acoustic session that we have from Fife's very own and Scotland's next big thing, the Shambots. There's going to be loads of great content in 2022. And we just aim to cater for all your Celtic and non-Celtic needs. So give us a like and please subscribe underneath. If you haven't to tell anybody to subscribe, tell your pals, tell your neighbours, tell your next door neighbours, tell folk that you didn't like to subscribe because they're going to get some cracking content. So hopefully as we move on for this pandemic world, remember in spite of all, the world is beautiful and keep treating people kindly and just keep it Celtic. Thanks very much everybody, we'll all see you later.